This is the Supernatural Book, Episode 7, The Storm. Now, Noah preached and worked on that ark for about 120 years, and he was just about 600 years old at this time. And, you know, there was a day when he would have woke up and put the last piece on that ark, and it would have been the day that the flood was coming. So I imagine he woke up one day and yawned and stretched out his arms and heard the birds chirping, you know, heard things continuing as they were once more. But he rolled over probably and looked at his wife and hopefully they still shared the same bed after all these hundreds of years. And he might have said, Joan, Joan, wake up. And I bet, I bet you didn't know his wife's name was Joan. I mean, it's just an educated guess, Joan of Arc. But uh, he just felt good about that day because that day uh, he put the last piece of gopher wood on that ark. And all of a sudden, about that time, he could hear those thunder clouds, something like a waterfall. And the Lord said, Okay, Noah, it's time. Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. And said, For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And no, uh, the Lord instructs Noah to take every clean beast by sevens, the male and his female, and to take the unclean beast by two, the male and his female, and that rugged preacher of righteousness who had just preached his heart out to the world of the ungodly would now enter into the ark. And all those years, the people mocked him, spit on him, slashed his tires, mailed him death threats, burnt down the church, said he was crazy, called him the town drunk, all while saying, where's the promise of his coming? Where's the promise of this storm coming, Noah? Oh, they would say that old man Noah's been preaching that since I was a kid. And I bought all these umbrellas for nothing. He's just another herald camping. Uh, the umbrella store done went out of business 30 years ago and I can't get my money back for all these umbrellas. And even with all the mockers and scoffers and false accusers and backstabbers and uh, liars replaying this, uh, was it was replaying again over in his head. I'm sure Noah went into that ark wishing himself accursed if that would mean just one of these souls might be saved even after all the things they said to him and all that time i don't reckon noah ever met a bfg a big friendly giant i don't guess any of those uh hybrids out there believed a word he said or they just didn't care and genesis 6 uh, 7 16 says and they that went in went in male and female of all flesh as god had commanded him and the lord shut him in and i'm sure miss noah was thinking to herself maybe the old man isn't so crazy after all and I'm sure Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Mrish Shem, and Mrish Ham, and Mrish Japheth were pinching themselves. They, they couldn't believe it. I mean, they had been making a good income working on that ark, had good benefits, 401k, a good retirement, and and they had all that working for Noah. They may have thought he was crazy, but the money was good, you know. And maybe they turned the construction of the ark into like a tourist thing. Maybe it was called. Something like the Ark Encounter or something like that. And everybody wanted to pay good money to come see the crazy old doom and gloom street preaching conspiracy theorist pastor named Noah as he built the world's biggest boat. But this day they said the last, they, they sold the last ticket and the Lord shut them in. And the only people that got on was Noah and his family, his three boys and his, their three wives and Noah's wife. That's all that got on. And once that door shut, you heard the kind of thunder that puts those bumps all over your skin and shivers down your spine. And big, huge drops of water began to fall down. And you can imagine the panic, the fear, the terror, and the horror as men began to see something that never happened before. Water began to fall from the sky. And all these people didn't have enough sense to get in out of the rain, so they all missed the boat. And I'm sure they got the strongest giants to try to pry that door open and get in the ark. They probably got crying mothers to scream at Noah and say, Would a loving God let my baby just drown? And Noah would have said, A loving God wouldn't want your baby to grow up as a devil-possessed, God-hating, flesh-loving wretch like yourself. You should have listened to the warnings. And... 
at this time, there was no more chance. And I'm just speculating, but maybe the angel of the Lord himself came down and shut the door. And he could have easily fought off and slayed about 185,000 giants with the sword. Uh, wouldn't you have liked to have been a fly on the wall and seen how the whole thing played out? I mean, we can just speculate about it, talk about it on a rainy day. We don't really know how the whole thing played out entirely. I always wanted to see all the Bible stories just like I was there in like a virtual reality or maybe ride through them like it was, you know, like a new uh, Six Flags ride or something like that. But the Bible says in Genesis seven eighteen through 24, And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark went upon the face of the waters, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. And all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, died, and every living stuff substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from off the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark, and the waters prevailed upon the earth an hundred and fifty days. And after that, the Lord made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged, and the fountains also of the deep, and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained, and the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the hundred and fifty days, the waters were abated, and the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. At the end of forty days, Noah opened a window at the top of the ark and sent out a raven. And it went out, and it went to and fro. So Noah sent a dove, and it found no rest for the sole of her foot. So he stayed in another seven days, and let her out again. And then she came back with a leaf in her mouth. So Noah knew he could get out with it without his rain boots on. And Noah got out of that ark, and he was on uh, he was on the mountaintop. He just had a mountaintop experience. And the devil tried to take over the earth with a counterfeit race back there in Genesis 6. But the man who hadn't been corrupted who hadn't had his seed corrupted, came out as king of the hill. As the father of the last family on the earth, I guess you could call him a king. I mean, he was the head of the house, and his house was the only thing left on the earth. So this is King Noah. The crown was now on Noah's head. And the first thing he does is build an altar. It says in Genesis 8.20, And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. I'm sure way back in Genesis 3, Adam wrote down what the Lord required. And he wrote down about the animal sacrifices and shedding innocent blood. And I'm, I'm sure he had it in writing about burnt offerings. These things would have been wrote down and handed down from generation to generation and told from generation to generation. Noah probably had Enoch's journal or something and stayed up reading that thing on proper offerings and sacrifices to God. He knew exactly how to offer a offering to God. And I'm sure he stuck a piece of that sword that God gave him personally into that journal to pass it on down to his boys, probably Shem specifically. He probably wrote down what the Lord had told him. And God told Noah to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And it was now up to Noah and his family to keep the human race going. And one day Noah went out and seen a huge rainbow in the clouds. And the Lord said, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which was between me and you, an ever living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And that old serpent that inhabits the air was full of indignation. I guarantee it. And once again, the Lord uh, reigned on his pride parade, literally this time. And if you zoom the camera up there in the layer of old Leviathan, which is the devil and Satan, you'd find him up there rubbing that long chin, maybe with a three-pronged flesh hook in his hand, and he's plotting his next, next move. And he probably thought to himself, I'm going to get the old man drunk. I'm going to get old Noah drunk. And, and that's what he did. Noah got hammered. He got some of that grape juice out of that vineyard. He became a husbandman and planted a vineyard. And he got some of that grape juice out of there. And things were different now after the flood. The atmosphere had changed. 
if that stuff sit around too long, it would it would be fermented and you can get drunk on it. So Noah guzzled that juice and sucked back on Grandpa's old cough medicine. He was sipping on some scissorp, as they call it. He got liquored. He got sauced. He got turnt. He got drunk as a skunk. He got blitzed. He got all hopped up on welches. He was just out of it. He was drunk. And uh, Mr. Noah thought, oh, no, the old man has gone cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs again. He's He's gone crazy again. He's lost his marbles this time. I think it's for real this time. And uh, Noah laid down uh, naked in his tent next to that six-pack of hooch. And he went off to sleep, and Noah didn't have the words of God about wine yet. He didn't He didn't know wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. He had no idea that he shouldn't look upon the wine when it's red, when it giveth its color in the cup, and moveth itself aright. He didn't know that it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. He didn't know that the excess was in the wine. So I don't think you could really say that Noah was in the wrong, if he didn't know. But if he knew, he was. But that old serpent watched the whole thing with an evil laugh and said to Ham, Ham, why don't you uh, go in there and check on your daddy, bud? And you see, the devil knew that Ham had a problem with his flesh. He was very fleshy. And well, what happened next when Ham went into Noah's tent and Noah was naked in there, what happened next definitely wasn't PG-13. It it wasn't R-rated. It wasn't just... TVMA, it was complete, unrated, unnatural filth. Although the perverts of today would want to think it's a G-rated love story or a good Disney movie script, possibly. But Ham went in there and uh, violated his own father. And this put a curse on Ham's descendants. And it says in Genesis nine twenty four through 25, And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And this sets the tone for alcohol. The old serpent had done it again. He got another curse put on man. The first time he did it, remember, was with fruit off of a tree. The second time he does it with fruit off of a tree. He uses grape juice off of the vine tree. And it sat around and fermented. No, I didn't know it. Got drunk off of it. But that old serpent, he got man cursed again. And so we'll begin again in the next episode, episode number eight.